Welcome to Inspiring Elders, a 13-part documentary produced and presented by Marie-Angeline Lascaux with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. What happens physiologically and psychologically as we grow older? What is the role of an elder in our society? What does positive aging mean? What part does nutrition play in remaining fit and healthy? And why is it so important to remain active in our later years? Why do so many of our elders engage in music, art, dance, poetry? Can we start a new careers in our 50s and 60s? What is the role of spirituality? And what does it mean to live a fulfilled life? All these questions and more will be answered by a panel of experts, including a professor of gerontology, medical doctors, an Ayurvedic doctor, a homeopath, a psychologist, dancers, writers, artists, teachers, healers, all of whom share a passion for life and a commitment to remain engaged with the younger generation. In this program, Anna Chu explains why it is vital to remain active and of service within the community. Mairead Conlon tells us why she feels each day is a gift. Eilish Kelly talks about her work as a teacher in disadvantaged sectors. Sister Stanislas Kennedy speaks about her work at Focus Island and what led to the creation of the sanctuary at the heart of Dublin. And Mary Brady shares that she would like to help the next generation. This program will close with a guided meditation. I'm 72. I'm 65. I still feel as though I'm 21, but 21 with a lot more wisdom than I had at 21, I suppose. I was 68 in July. I'm actually an old age pensioner. I get a great kick out of that. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how important it is for you to stay active and be of service to the community. Well, I think being active is really important from two different perspectives. One, physically, it's really important to keep active because otherwise your body degenerates a lot, a lot quicker. But also from the point of view of mental stimulation and actually feeling some sort of fulfillment in life, I think it's important to... I always look for new things, new things that I can study, new things that I can get involved in. Because it's very easy to become stuck with what you're used to doing, with a routine. I think that for me would be very difficult. I would find that I would stagnate with that sort of thing, you know. So I need to find new avenues of thought and new avenues of experience and being older has not made that any less uh, inviting for me. Age is just a number isn't it? I look in the mirror and I go, are you really 68? And I'm going, no you're not. I don't see it, I don't feel it, I don't act it, unfortunately. I'm me, who I am. The body might be getting older, the skin might be getting older, the hair might be falling out, but I'm still me. I am just so delighted to be still here. My mother died when I was only four years old, and my mother was expecting another baby, and she died along with the baby at age 30. Now, somewhere in my makeup, I must have believed that when I became 30, I would die too. So by the time I got to 30, I had three children. Uh, I had another one since. And I remember praying that God would leave me with my children long enough to see them go into secondary school. Because I felt at that point, at least they would have had all those years of learning and teaching from my husband and I and that they would have a good grounding in what was right and what was wrong and they'd be well able to cope. 
I never asked for another day when I got to age 30 because I am so grateful for what I have and I'm so thankful that I have lived to see my children reared, grown, married and I now have four grandchildren with another one on the way. For me, that's the magic of it. So to me, the object of the exercise is to make the best of every day and to live each moment with joy and gratitude for what I have. And I have so much. Life is amazing and magic and wonderful. So how do you actually keep off service to the community? Can you give me some example? Well, I still work, therefore I don't have much spare time to actually get involved in too many community activities, except those that involve things that I'm very interested in myself, uh, which is probably very selfish, but in actual fact, I love the work that I do because it has brought together all of my experiences in life. And I hope that it is now in turn helping other people I was a nurse for many years, for 30 years. I was a homeopath for quite a long time. I've learned over the years to understand a little bit more about the deeper meaning of life, certainly for myself. And I've learned a lot from all of my mistakes. And it's a time when I can look back on those and forgive myself and forgive other people. And at the same time, understand what the learning was for me. So that, for me, is what gracious harvesting is about. It's about accepting the years that I've lived and honouring those years and actually being able to look back and see when I thought things were going so terribly wrong. In hindsight, they probably were not because it was probably part of my journey to learn whatever lesson it was that I needed to learn. So I can bring that wisdom to bear on anything that I do now. And I feel that's the same for many people in their older years. And yet the perception of age in our country is, uh, I think we're a very ageist society. And I notice it myself, how people react when they look at an older face. It's not the same as when they react to an, a younger person. And there's a certain tone in the voice, <laughs> which is, quite honestly, I find extremely condescending. And I try not to think less of the people who say it, who speak to me like that. But I just can't help thinking how lacking in wisdom they are, you know. And I don't think we value wisdom as a society either. Uh, we kind of lost that sense of value a long time ago. We used to value our elders. As I become older, I realize that, that that's no longer so. Most of the time it doesn't bother me very much. But I would love to see something happen to actually change that perception of older people in society. In England, it's the same sort of problem. It's only in, the, in, in sort of Eastern societies or different societies that are older and wiser societies that elders are still held in high esteem. Nelson Mandela recently formed the elders, or not recently, several years ago. Because of this particular problem, he recognized that the elders were always the leaders of the tribes and those who people sought wisdom from, but he recognising that this was no longer the case, he actually formed a group called the Elders. Many eminent older people who use their wisdom collectively to inspire other people. I went through the era of creative drama. I went through working with disadvantaged group. But coming into my late 50s, I moved much more over into the teaching role. I give two completely different types of teaching. One is very technical type of teaching where I'd be working, for example, with VTAC courses. But again, these would be all mostly people who are in dis the disadvantaged bracket getting them to look at communications, to look at social studies, to examine their communities, to look at teamwork, how do you work in groups. But on the other level, the whole 
therapies, the ones that helped me to find my soul, myself, they would be through dreams, through art therapy, through colour therapy, and I deliver training in all of those as well. So I'm looking to pass my skills to the next generation. Books Ireland was founded for people who don't have a home, for people who are out of home, mm-hmm. and the services are provided are, are directly for people who are either at risk of homelessness or who are homeless. It's a very big program at, in terms of helping people, preventing people to become homeless in the first place, but then if they do, there's interventions at all the early stage, mm-hmm. then if they're longer homeless, there's other kinds of interventions, and the whole idea is to enable people to find another home and to settle into that home and to become integrated into the community. So there's a whole range of interventions and supports along that journey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you work for, you have also founded an organisation to do with Im- immigrants, mm-hmm. to help them. In which way? The Immigrant Council of Ireland, that's just 10 years old now, that is a, an organisation that provides advice, information and legal support. It's a law centre, recognised law centre, so it provides legal advice but also in some cases litigation. When I started that, many migrants were coming to the country to work Mm -hmm. and to study and there was no service to help them to find their way in Ireland or to help them identify their rights and to support and promote their rights. So basically that's what the Immigrant Council does, it supports and promotes the rights of immigrants. Uh, Sanctuary was something that emerged from my work in Focus Ireland to provide what those homeless women decided were needed in Dublin. And that was a 24-hour phone service, an information advice service, a coffee shop come restaurant, and an outreach service, people working on the streets at night that they could trust. And when we set up that service, immediately men, women and children came, and the services were fully used and more than fully used and more needs emerged and so it expanded into supportive housing and into a um, day centre for young people and the, over the years it has grown and developed and now it's an organisation that is the biggest voluntary body working with homeless people in Ireland and it provides a whole range of services and housing and activities for people who are homeless. When I was working in the city in the early years, I discovered very quickly that the the work was very demanding on everybody, on our staff and volunteers, it was endless, the amount of work that had to be done. And there was also the uh, hustle and bustle of city life, the speed of of the city and the aggression of the city. And I felt that everybody needed a place they could go to, where they would find rest and solace and peace and to be renewed themselves. So I had the idea of a place in the city that would be in the city but apart from the city. A place that would be beautiful and that would be inspiring and that would provide whatever programs were needed to give this kind of stillness and peacefulness to people who live who live very harassed lives. And I gradually built this a centre, first of all, the, these rooms, and made them as beautiful as I could make them. And then we developed the garden, which is a replica of the rooms, three circular gardens. Gradually people started to come. I suppose my basic commitment is to guard in the service of the poor. I joined the Sisters of Charity because I work with the poor and that's what I wanted to do with my life, to work with the poor. And I spent 20 years in Kilkenny uh, developing social services in Kilkenny before I came to Dublin in 1983. But it was always, I suppose, trying to identify what are the needs of people who are in the margins now. It was clear that there was very little happening with regard to homeless people. 
when I set up Focus Ireland over 25 years ago now. It was very clear 10 years ago there was very little happening to the emerging needs of immigrants. And then the Young Social Innovators, which is enabling young people to be active in their communities. That's another way of responding to need, but it is enabling this year we have 6,000 young people from around the country actively involved in their community, identifying needs and setting up projects to respond to them. I couldn't do it all myself, but I, people came around me, and I suppose they're the real heroes in the sense that they came around to help and support and develop the services, and still do, hundreds of them, staff and volunteers. So it's a whole lot of people who are responding to the needs. I have retired from different things, but then started something else. I suppose I'm very fortunate that I can be that way with the organisations, mm -hmm. that I don't have the big responsibility of running them the way I did. Not everybody can do that, because if people retire, often they don't find a way back in right. to the services again. So I, I, I'm i lucky and happy, you know, to be able to do yes. this. Yeah. My life, really, is about life with God. That, I suppose, is, supports me in my daily life. It also inspires me in my daily life. So it's very much part of of my day and of my week and of my year that part of every day is, is is a time of silence and of prayer and the other part of the day is a time of, of service but it's all it's all about being in the presence of God to me that it's all service of God in the poor that it mm. is I do believe that we're all really connected we're all one people we're really all one body it's all one breath that we all breathe from the beginning of time until the end of time I am mind, body, spirit. So the fulfilment then has to be the fulfilment of the mind, body and spirit. We all need intellectual inspiration and nourishment and we all need to have our bodies cared for. So a fulfilled life for me is when there's that holistic approach to life. I think the older generation have an awful lot to learn from the younger generation as well and that, that has been brought home to me quite significantly recently since I've been teaching. I think it's wonderful to actually look at life through their eyes and there's a lot of wisdom and there's a lot of young philosophers out there in them as well but they do see life maybe sometimes slightly differently. So we can see life through their eyes and, and they can see life through our eyes. And I think that would enrich everybody's life to be able to do that. There shouldn't really be a distinction between young and old because we're all just people, we're just human beings, all having different experiences. But collectively, we can really enrich and, and nourish each other if we can find it in our hearts to respect each other and to acknowledge our differences and um, acknowledge our sameness because we have a lot that we share together. I've always brought young people into the services and provided training for them and support for them. I see that as trying to get more and more young people to do the kind of work that I have done and that other people have done. Well, I think life is more slower, you know, a bit, um, and more reflective. Um, I think about things a lot more. I don't feel I have to rush around doing anything very much. It's, it's kind of different. But I don't feel inside, I don't feel I feel much the same as I always did. I would like to help the next generation, and I'm really interested in the next generation, or the next two generations in my case, our grandchildren. I'd like to feel that I'd made it make a difference to them. That might be things they they feel they could talk to me about, or there might be ways I could help them that I'd be really happy to do. Or other people either, people who are bereaved, that, that interests me too, because I work with Bethany, which is an organization for the uh, support of the bereaved. And any anybody in my family, it's mostly family you meet in that way, a younger generation, 
any of them that want any kind of support or help in that way, they know I'm available for that and would be happy to help them whatever way I could. My family is everything. And my grandchildren are everything. What do I teach them about love, joy, gratitude, just just being, living in the moment, just enjoying every moment. My journey is my journey. I came here to do stuff, to be stuff, to learn stuff, to experience emotions and spirituality and God and a husband and children and family and grandchildren. And so I want to experience it to the full. So when I leave and I go back to where I came from, I won't be saying, oh gosh, I should have done that. I've been blessed with great energy. Thank God I have always had great energy. All my life I have amazing energy. You know you can't take it with you when you die. So my attitude is, well why not use it up? I can still dance, I can sing, I can go out, I can entertain, I can cook, I can sew, I can knit. So in my mind every day is a new day. I don't think of it as getting older or younger. I just think of it as it's a new day, a new opportunity. Get over it. Get on with it. Um, I mean, there's so much out there now that our parents didn't have. We're living in a very magical age. And I mean, look, what's coming is going to be even more magical and special. I will now lead you into a guided meditation to relax and connect with your spirit guide. Sit comfortably, feet firmly on the floor, spine lifted, eyes closed, relaxing into the sockets, lips parted just enough to release your toes and softening all the muscles of your face. Relax your shoulders and rest your hands on your laps and take a moment to adjust the position of your body so you're really comfortable. See can you switch yourself away from your usual train of thoughts and bring your awareness inwards, noticing the breath flowing in and out of your body, noticing the way your body responds to the breath. And with each new breath, let yourself move deeper and deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper with each new breath, going deep inside yourself, inside your body, inside your breath, and connecting with a place so deep that you nearly forgot it existed. A place only you can access. A place right at the core of your being. Where there is no more yesterday, no more tomorrow. Just now, this moment, right here, right now. And that beautiful connection between body and breath. As you continue to breathe softly and effortlessly, allow yourself to move into the dream world. And in this dream world, you are connecting with your spirit guides. It could be a loved one who has moved on, an angel, or it could be a guide. There may be an image coming to you or there could be a feeling, a sensation. Try not to anticipate how your spirit guide manifests for you, but let yourself open up to receive a message. It may be whispered in your ear, 
may be a gift that is put in your hands. It may be an image, a symbol, allowing yourself to be open. Thank you, guide. And keeping your awareness with the breath, let the breath bring you back through your body, through my voice, to this present moment right here, right now, noticing the sounds around you, noticing how your body feels, allowing yourself to move your fingers and toes, moving your head from side to side, stretching your arms, your legs, your spine, stretching your whole body. And when you feel ready, on an out breath, open your eyes to a new moment. You were listening to Inspiring Elders, a 13 parts documentary produced and presented by Marion Jean Lasco with the support of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. This program featured Anna Chu, Marit Conlon, Eilish Kelly, Sister Stanislas Kennedy, and Mary Brady. The music on this program is from Seamus Barn and you can find out more about his music on www.brotherseamus.ie If you want to get in touch with any of the contributors, you can contact us through www.springintolife.ie Tune in again next week to find out the importance of diet and nutrition in remaining fit and healthy in our later years.